we will be going through the tutorial. So this is a live, live coding demonstration, so always risky. I'll just put this link in the chat. Okay, so if I'm, if I'm gonna click that link, and then you can, um, it's just going to my GitHub and I created a little um, tutorial document that we'll be running through. So everyone have that? Take that as a yes. Gavin, thumbs up. Okay, cool. All right. So we'll go to the, you can click the getting started link. Oh, that didn't work. Yeah, I just have to go up here, go to the um, learning resources. Click on this resources MD. Yeah, I need to fix the links. So, well. so anyways, um, I, all I've done here is I put some, some useful resources that I found for helping you to uh, get familiar with Compute Canada. I met with Gavin and Marshall earlier today and they even, or um, Gavin mentioned that there's a tutorial going on today at 2 p.m. Um, put on by the Compute Canada, it's one of their, their staff members for new users. So, you know, regularly um, there are training sessions being um, put on by different Compute Canada groups. And so you can easily sign up for those. When I have um, information on those, I'll send them your way too. But like I said, the Compute Canada Wiki, there's like so much useful information here on getting started too. Um, there's this getting started series, which kind of you can walk through that. There's some good stuff on Linux. Um, AI and machine learning Wikipedia page, which is probably of interest to lots of us. And then there are lots of good um, individual consortiums like SharkNet or SciNet. They have really good resources too. Especially being impressed by the SciNet. Um, they always, I mean, this is out of Toronto, U of T. Um, they always seem to be having new tutorial sessions going on. Like they have one ongoing on programming with R, neural network programming, and they're like, tons of great resources, um, like the Linux shell, if you're interested in that. And um, you can, uh, yeah, you can sign in here and look at all the videos and everything with your Compute Canada username and password. So there's tons of good stuff here. Like you can learn about Python for MRI analysis. Like, I don't know, that's kind of cool. So you know, wanted to, you know, do some side projects or something. I mean, this is uh, this is really neat stuff, so. Okay, and then there's also YouTube pages um, like Westgrid. They have a, a good amount of YouTube content. You can pretty much type in like Compute Canada in YouTube and you'll find a whole bunch of interesting things. So yeah, this is just a really neat sandbox of things that you can try and do. So lots of things relevant to our research too, but also things that you can um, explore and try. And because we have access to this amazing compute resource, you can try some neat things. So. Okay, so good there. So now we'll go to the first um, thing I want to do, and this is see how long this takes, but this is kind of the, one of the main things I want to do is show how you can run a Jupyter notebook in, in uh, on Compute Canada. So, We'll have Compute Canada running. Um, it'll be powering the, the Jupyter Notebook in the back end, and uh, you'll be displaying it on your local web browser. So that's kind of the thing we'll be doing. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Jupyter Notebook, um, it's a great, I guess, interactive coding environment that has really been adopted by, I think, uh, partially software development and machine learning 
in general. And the idea is you can prototype your code and uh, explore interactively with your code and your data inside a Jupyter notebook. You can sort of flesh out what the idea that you have, um, build your models perhaps. And then once you've sort of proven test ideas and concepts in your Jupyter notebook, then you move your, your code into a, a Python script, into something that is um, easier to, to run um, and also easier to debug and uh, share the code with and stuff. So it's kind of a, a good little example here of a suggested pipeline. If you are doing deep learning, this is from PyTorch. You start with the Jupyter Notebook, you explore the data and you prototype models, and you build your, your classes and methods inside cells inside the notebook. And then you move your, your uh, code to Python script. And then finally you train and deploy on a server. So, I mean, in a, in a, uh, I guess a non-academic setting, you might be using like Azure or um, Amazon web, web services perhaps, or maybe your own local compute infrastructure to train your, your models or do your, do your model training. But in our case, we have Compute Canada. We have this great resource so we can use that. Okay. So um, yeah, this tutorial is based off of, let's zoom in here. The tutorial is based off of uh, this Compute Canada Wiki page and also this YouTube video. So I've kind of modified it to suit our needs. So I, I think I asked most of you to install MOBA Xterm or have it available. So everyone's got that. If you want to follow along, thumbs up. So I'm going to open up my MOBA Xterm here. It's over here. Okay. So Mobile Xterm is just a terminal client. If you if you um, use a Mac regularly or if you use Linux, you'll be familiar with what a terminal is. But for Windows, it's an um, interactive shell environment that you can type in commands. Um, so that's what we'll be using. So you go start a local terminal. I'll zoom in here. So everyone's there. If I'm going too fast or anything, just uh, let me know. Ask, just put up your hand or something. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so we'll be logging in. So how to do that, you go SSH. Like this here, logging in SSH dash Y, and then your username. So yeah, so SSH-Y, so mine is tvhan at graham.computecanada.ca. Press enter, and then it'll ask you to type in your password, so. Okay, so now we're logged into the Compute Canada system. Everyone got there? Because yes, Gavin gives thumbs up. Excellent. Oh, one uh, useful shortcut or trick to clear your screen when you're in a terminal client. This works in Mobile Xterm and in Windows and in Linux and Mac. Press Control L, so you can you can scroll up with your mouse wheel and then it uh, to move up to move the cursor up to the top. Just pr press Control and then press L, and that clears it. So that's a very kind of useful um, shortcut to uh, clear your screen. Okay, so now we have logged in. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with a Linux environments, um, there's lots of, uh, I have a little note here that tells you a bit about the Linux um, environment and some typed commands. There's lots of useful typed commands. <laughs> I'm by no means an expert, but um, 
I mean, you can make your whole career out of, I mean, being an expert in Linux. You can, it's the back end, it's, the, it's what runs the internet essentially. So um, yeah, there's lots you can do, but you can get away with some really simple commands. So first of all, we'll do um, pwd, that's print working directory. And so that will show you the directory that you're currently in. So right now I'm in my home directory and uh, my home directory is, is called TV Han. That's my username. So press control L. Another really useful command is CD. CD is change directory. So if you just type in CD and press enter, that'll take you back to your home directory, which we're currently in. So yeah, we're in the same spot. Another useful command is um, ls, list something. I forget what it means exactly. Uh, but what it does is it lists all the different files and um, folders you have in this directory. So right now we're in our, I, I have a bunch of stuff in here already. Um, I have like some stuff that I've been doing on some for work and all that stuff. Uh, some things that are important here are the scratch folder. The scratch folder is is where you can store um, files and uh, um, data that you need to access very quickly and rapidly. Um, so, say you need to iterate over this data set like hundreds of thousands of time times, you wouldn't want to be doing that from a project directory. You want to copy your data to the scratch folder, and then have your scripts access it from the scratch folder. The near line is kind of like an archival um, folder. So if you have work or data sets that you aren't going to be using for a long time, you can put them in there and that will uh, yeah, sort of archive them. And that, that saves Compute Canada, I guess, um, money and also, um, yeah, frees up space for us too. And then the project folder is, is where you'll, um, I mean, you can put, project files in your home directory, which I've done, obviously. You can also put them in your projects folder. So yeah, we'll be doing that. Oh, I should also say that we're in the login node. So this is the login node. I have a little note here. The login node is, is um, I mean, just open to everyone, but you aren't supposed to be running like computationally intensive tasks in it. You can use it for, um, compiling some things and, and uh, you know, cleaning up folders and that, but you shouldn't be running like deep learning models and stuff from the login node. If you do, I mean, you might get banned. So you don't want that to happen. So we'll be going to the uh, projects folder and then we'll be downloading this, we'll be cloning this repository. So this, this GitHub page that I've made, be cloning that into your project folder. So, um, so we're CD projects. And um, notice there, I, I was like typing going CD PRO, then you can press tab and it will automatically go to um, the, the folder that is um, closest to that name. So we'll go click that. Now you can see, now we're in the projects folder. Let's do LS and see what folders are in here. So we have the def Machewski. So this is the allocation that is the default sort of allocation that all researchers get. Um, so Dr. Machewski got this one. And this is the allocation that we got from um, uh, the rack, the award that we got. Doesn't really like, for some groups, they might have like data sets that are like, I don't know, like say 200 terabytes or something. Like they, there's not enough space to put that in your default um, allocation. So that's why you would need to specifically ask for say a larger uh, amount of storage. Anyways, we're, we're gonna go to the Def Machewski. So, you know, CD Def Machewski. And there we go. Let's see what's in there. There. So now you can see all these different, these are all us group members here. Um, these are their personal folders. Now I can't um, necessarily ask access other people's. So like if I wanted to 
EDGMCC. You know, it's like permission denied. So I don't have privileges, which makes sense, right? So I can go in and uh, steal all Gavin's. I assume that's Gavin's stuff. So he's good. Okay, so I cleared that. Um, yeah, so um, I'm going to navigate into my own project directory and you can navigate into your own. So whatever your username is. And uh, so once you're in your project directory, yours should be empty. I mean, I have a bunch of stuff in here. I'm going to delete, I've already cloned this repository in here. I'm gonna delete it. So this sometimes happens. Control C lets you um, sort of cancel whatever command you had. So this thing's not deleting. So um, rm dash r f, which is recursively deleting all the files and I'm forcing it in. There you go. Now you can see, I, I don't have this Compute Canada um, folder in there anymore. I've deleted it. So now you should be in your own personal folder in your the Def Machevsky project directory. So yours would be home, whatever username is, projects, Def Machevsk, and your username. Now we can clone the repository that um, I have here. So go copy. Get clone. So this is just, um, yeah, the, the Git clients, which is uh, really a great tool system. <laughs> it's installed by default on all Linux and Mac machines. Um, yeah, so we just downloaded that, that folder here. And now if we do a ls, we can see that that's right there. So I've just download, download, downloaded that. And we'll be using this later when we start our Jupyter Notebook. We'll be accessing files and notebooks from that. Okay, and I, if, if you don't have a GitHub account, I'd, you know, I'd recommend you get one and start using it. Um, and uh, yeah, essentially, if you're doing your research and you can regularly be using it, maybe you have an idea you want to try, you can create a new Git branch and sort of go on that path, explore something. If you don't like it, you can just easily move back to your previous state. Um, and it's also will help you in case you have your, um, I don't know, your computer breaks or something, you can um, access all your stuff on your GitHub account. Okay, so now that we have this uh, Compute Canada HBC a repository clone, we can start working on our virtual environment. So we'll be creating a virtual environment, um, which is a way to contain a bunch of different Python packages in uh, an environment that is, is virtually set aside. So um, if you end up messing up, it's not the end of the world, you just delete it and start over. And it also makes it easy to reproduce that environment. You can copy that environment and send it to someone else or um, reproduce if, if need be. And it uh, just helps you manage all the dependencies. So we're gonna go from this, this directory to your home directory. So type in CD. And now we should, now we're back at our home directory. So we're going to be using um, Python 3.6. Um, Compute Canada and many high performance computing environments um, have kind of prepackaged modules that contain really useful uh, packages or software programs. So um, one of the modules is, is, is a Python module. 
Now there's another interesting thing you do is go module list, press enter. This gives you the modules that are currently installed. So if you look at that, we have standard environment 2020. So this is like the standard environments. Um, I think it includes like Python 3.8 and some other things. These are a bunch of different things used for, I don't know, like running the high performance computing environment. <laughs> That's me. But we want to run Python 3.6 because of compatibility issues. I mean, you'll just run into these things. You just have to try things and uh, get it working. So to do that, we type in module load Python slash 3.6, and then go enter. Now, if we do module list, see, it says Python 3.6 right there. So we have Python 3.6 loaded. Now we can create a virtual environment. So before you create a virtual environment, you want to make sure you have the right, at least version of Python um, you have uh, that you need installed. Often, you know, the default will be fine, but um, because we're loading some TensorFlow packages and stuff, it's a little bit more bespoke. So we have to be a bit more careful. So to create a virtual environment, um, there's a tool that's used that uh, comes standard with the Python um, ecosystem. That's Virtual Environment Manager, and so we can create a virtual environment called Jupyter One. So that's what we'll do. So we'll just type this in. I pressed enter and it's created our virtual environment. Now this virtual environment, if I, um, I'll just clear my terminal here, control L, go LS, you'll see that it's right there, Jupyter one. So if I were to go change directory to Jupyter one, LS, there's the bin folder, and inside the bin folder is an activate. Um, the bin folder is in Linux, is where all the, um, uh, the programs that um, you can execute are stored. That's, uh, so that's just something good to know. So we can activate this virtual environment by typing in this thing here, source squiggly tilde, I guess, uh, for slash Jupyter one slash bin slash activate. So we'll type that in. Bin, and you press tab and I'll end the uh, end the next or end the word activate, press tab, source, and then press enter. Now you can see right here that um, Jupyter One, that means that our virtual environment is activated. So now we can install Python packages inside this virtual environment and not kind of base up or mess up our base environment, which is really good, which is what we want to do. Next thing which we want to do, which you should always probably do, um, and this is necessary for using Python 3.6, um, you need to install index Wait. So pip is the package manager that again is a default um, uh, program that comes with standard Python on all systems. And so it helps manage all these different uh, Python packages and the dependencies between them. So we want to upgrade this pip. So press enter. Oh, what did I do wrong here? Oh, that's why I forgot to add the pip. Pip install. So pip install index. The no index refers um, Compute Canada has, they already have compiled a whole bunch of different um, packages and they sit on the Compute Canada system already um, in, in wheels. They're, they're already there ready to deploy. So it's very easy to grab them and then having to like download them from the internet. You can just already take them from the Compute Canada system 
And in many cases, they've worked out um, problems with installations of them. So where you can, um, you should use this no index and install packages that are from the Compute Canada system. And you can see a whole list of them right here in this tip. There's a whole, um, oops, there's a whole bunch of these. I don't know. Anyways, it's on one of these tabs. Stupid. I hear available Python wheels. So these are just all the different Python packages that are readily available on the Compute Canada system. So I mean, you'll find lots of them here, like say one that's scikits learn. Scikit-learn is right there. So many of the most common ones are, are already here, which you can just easily grab. And then you don't have to download them uh, from the internet and you'll save yourself time. So anyways, um, I'll press enter. We'll upgrade our pip. And it's working. All right. So there we go, um, we've upgraded PIP. Now we can install some kind of basic data science um, machine learning packages. So we'll be installing scikit-learn, pandas, just great for dealing with tables, tabular data, matplotlib, which is a plotting library, Seaborn, which is a, another plotting library that I've used, kind of helps make things look nice and pretty. So we'll be installing all these. So I'll just copy these and then paste. So this might uh, take a little bit of time sometimes. Um, this isn't a crazy installation, but one thing, because we do have a, a, a rack, a, um, we do have an allocation award, you can always spin up a, uh, like a, a node, say, say grab two or three CPUs with maybe like four gigabytes of RAM or something and install your, create your virtual environment through that. And then as soon as you're done creating your virtual environment, you can close down that allocation um, rather than just doing it from the login node. But generally this, this does work. Sometimes it's a bit slower because it's just loading, so. Anyone got any good jokes? Tough crowd, hey? Tough crowd. Not yet. <laughs> there we go. Are people following along, by the way, or are you just kind of like trying to absorb it? Because <laughs> you can always just do this on your own afterwards, too. So I don't know if I'm going too fast or too slow. So. Okay, so now we've installed all these. Um, now I want to install TensorFlow and Jupyter Lab. Jupyter Lab is what will be used to run the Jupyter Notebook, the notebook. The TensorFlow, well, that's a deep learning library. So just copy that. And then I'll paste that in. Okay, there you go. So if you were like doing without doing this without the no index, I think it would probably, I think it looks first for the, the package on the Compute Canada, Canada system, but if that wasn't there, you know, it would take potentially quite a long time to download and install because I think TensorFlow, if you've installed on your own computer, I think it's like close to a gigabyte of um, data and all that stuff. So it's just installing all these different packages. It's a lot of crap. Gavin says he's fresh out of jokes, so too bad. I 
right? It's coming. I've done this a number of times, so I know I, I know it works. And if you were like, I don't know, when you do start doing some deep learning or installing this or this package, it's not uncommon that you'd find some incom incompatibility or something. Um, that's why there are some useful like uh, modules. Um, like one of them is the SciPy. I think I mentioned it here. Uh, there's like the SciPy, oh yeah, SciPy stack 2020B module. That this this module, you can just module load SciPy stack 2020B it includes like pandas, sci, um, uh, pandas, like SciPy, NumPy, like all the real important ones that you would need. Um, so you can quickly load that. But I found that there were compatibility issues with that and pandas and then installing TensorFlow. I don't know why. So, so you have to kind of like figure it out. But once you have your virtual environment going and it works, then it's just really easy to, to call that up and do whatever you want. So of course, it's just taking longer than I want. So. Do you have any, um, Tim, do you have any workarounds that are common for dealing with incompatibilities? Um, no, I mean, other than just trying things. Um, I'll, get, I'll give you a case example. Yeah. Um, for Marshall and I's deep learning project, I had to install certain modules in a certain order. Mm. Uh, because if I installed, say, PyTorch, before TensorFlow, the version of NumPy, it would install, would be incompatible with the version of TensorFlow I was trying to install. Yeah, you know, th that's exactly the same thing I did here. Like this, this installation, um, yeah, like this, I intentionally wrote this out this way in the tutorial. Okay. Like you have to install Pandas first. For whatever reason, pandas seem to be causing an issue with, like, there's NumPy pandas incompatibility. Yeah. And so I don't know, like, it's something that's just there. I mean, and, and also with Python 3.8. So I just, like, kind of reverted to a prior, um, a more old, like, the Python 3.6, which is what, I don't know, like 2018 or something, which is fine. Um, yeah. And so it's just a little bit more tested, I think. So okay, because that's that's good because I mean, they're huge environments. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, on my local computer, which runs Linux, I typically use Conda, like Anaconda, right? Package manager there. So kind of getting into the weeds there, but it's a little bit more robust than pip. Like okay, it's able to figure out some things, and specifically Conda Forge, where they have like like it's just community sort of compiled list of packages and that, like they make sure that everything's pretty compatible. So that's probably the easiest way, but you can't run Anaconda on Compute Canada systems. So you probably could, but it's really hacky, I think and not recommended, so. Okay, cool. But if you want, I can meet with you offline or send you whatever I have on that later, so. Neat. Good question. Okay, so anyways. Um, now our everything's installed, our environment should be good to go, which means we should be able to run Jupyter Lab, open up a Jupyter Notebook. To do that, um, we need to create a little um, bash file. So that's a, a ex executable file that when we call on it, um, it will know to open up Jupyter Lab and sort of, I guess, port that instance to a certain um, IP address. So something like that. So to do that, <clears throat> we need to create a little um, bash script. So we'll do that using the, the nano um, text editor, which is get the default text editor in, in Linux. So we'll just type this in, let's copy that. So this will go into the virtual environment uh, bin folder and create a notebook.sh file. So it's a text file. So now we're in the nano program. Now we can just copy in this 
this bin, this bash script. All bash scripts, um, call the, uh, um, they start with a hash, exclamation mark, hash bang, I think something like that. And um, that's how you know it's a bash script. And so we'll copy that in. Then we'll press control O to save. I'll name to write, yes, we want that. And then control X to exit out of it. So now we've created this notebook.sh into our virtual environment. However, we can't execute it yet. I mean, so we need to change the, the, um, the privilege of that notebook.sh. So to do that, we'll use um, the change, the, we'll modify the privileges using the chmod um, command. Control C, copy that. And I'll paste that into our terminal. Good, so now our notebook.sh um, file, we can, um, the user can execute it. Um, and so we'll, we'll be using that. So now comes the fun part. Um, now we'll actually go ahead and request an allocation. So we'll request um, four CPUs, two gigabytes of RAM per CPU. So eight gigabytes of RAM total and for, we'll request one hour and that will be used and that um, will call on the notebook.sh we just created, which will open up a Jupyter notebook or, or um, an instance. So it's just easiest just to copy all that, paste it in. So you can see um, what's going on here. One thing is, um, Obviously, this def.prof account isn't correct. So you just scroll back and change it to our rack allocation. So RRRRP the chess. So that's our rack allocation. You can try the def chess, but you probably won't get. Uh, uh, an instance and allocation right away if you have to do that. Okay, so I think we're good. I think that's good there. Press enter. And yeah, so pending job allocation, job queued. Great, node, nodes. So one of the nodes is um, allocated, ready for the job. All right. So now we actually have Jupyter Lab, so Jupyter Notebook instance. Um, running except obviously like it, it's not outputting it to any screen so we have to uh, ssh we have to tunnel tunnel into this instance and uh, open it up our own local computer so um yeah so you you, you know this looks like this like you say here in the uh, tutorial so we'll ssh tunnel from our local computer into this jupyter lab jupyter notebook so to do that, first you got to open up a new terminal window. So you can add a new tab to your MOBA extra. And uh, we'll do um, uh, tunnel into it. So to do that, you go S S H L eight 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 eight. So from port eight eight eight, which is that's the local port we want to be uh, sending the the notebook to. And then we need to put in something like this, which is just, um, you can see down here, it's, it's like that. So if, if you're following along right now, put in your own, um, your own node and whatever else has been put into there. So we're gonna copy this section. Gram, so I'm on node 614, gram 614.gram.sharknet. And it's going through port 8888 as well. Copy that. And I'll paste that in there. Oh, I got a little accidentally copied this forward slash. Let's get rid of that. And then you need to type in your credentials, TV Han, so whatever yours is. 
gibihan at graham computes canada ca and that looks good and press enter it'll ask for your password and there we go so now we are logged in we've um uh, tunneled um from our local computer into this Jupyter notebook so next thing you want to do is in your local computer so in your local web browser which is this one right here. You want to copy this, the HTTP four slash four slash localhost eight 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 token. Copy, go up there, and we need to enter in this token, which is from our first tab in our MOBA X term. So my token is six one EA whatever whatever. So I copy all that. Oh, sorry. And I need to paste it into my browser. Now cross your fingers, I hope this works. <laughs> I think it's working, yes. All right, so, um, here we are. I have, um, yeah, we have a Jupyter notebook, Jupyter Lab instance running on our on your local browser, but it's all being powered in back end on Compute Canada systems. So, I mean, you can see how this could be useful if you have, say, a big data set or something. You want to do data exploration. I mean, it's a good chance you don't have. 128 gigabytes of RAM on your computer or something, or, you know, um, so you can essentially run your notebooks on your computer and uh, it'll be exactly like you're doing it on your, on your local computer. So is everyone good so far? I don't know if people are following along or what. Should I wait or? Let Gavin gives a thumbs up. But regardless, if you, um, I mean, you can always watch this again or and try it again on your own. And, and if, if you need to, I'm more than happy to sit down with you one on one and, and help walk, walk you through whatever um, problems you may be having. So, so we're going to go to our projects folder because we just um, created. We created this, or we cloned the GitHub repository, the Compute Canada HP, HPC, the tutorial repository. And then I'm going to go to the Create Notebooks tab. And uh, we have two notebooks in here, Milling Data Exploration and Building a VAE. And so this is just ripped off from my uh, research, my, my master's research. So <laughs> recycling content here, which is great. Uh, so I'm going to open up this one. And here we are, we have a, a, a Jupyter notebook. Um, and the great thing about this is that, uh, yeah, just, I mean, you can explain the code that you're writing and uh, then it's easily um, transferable to someone else and they can kind of see what's going on. So you can press shift and enter, which goes to the next cell. And so I'll run this first one, shift, enter. There we go, we've loaded all these packages. I'm going to um, set up some file directories. And then I'm going to extract the mil.zip, which is in the raw folder, the, the raw data folder. And then sure enough, if you were to go to our, you were to go to your terminal and navigate to your, projects folder yes. so let's go to cd02 
S. Oops. S. So I want to go to this data folder. C data. Uh, yeah, so I just extracted the file that was in mil.zip, which is a, it's a MATLAB file, mil.mat. So we'll just be going, I'm not going to go through all this. You can, I'll just go through it quick. Um, load the mat fi MATLAB file. You can see what dictionary, what keys are in the dictionary. What the data kind of looks like. What are the different field names? Then we'll explore some of the meta metadata. And then we'll look at some of the cuts that are in this file. So cut number 166 is like that. 17 is like that. This is like a cut that is bad. So I mean, doing data exploration, you have a new data set. First thing, one of the first things you want to do is kind of understand what the data structure looks like, look at the metadata, and then actually, um, uh, yeah, find if there's anything weird about the data set. So you need to understand what's going on. Cut 94 is also weird. Cut 105 or 106 is strange. And then we'll create one plot that shows everything all in one. So there. Now, the next thing we're going to do is um, open up another notebook. I'm not going to go through this in detail either, but um, I run all this and we are going to practice training a variational autoencoder. So, which is kind of looks like this. So, I'm just pressing Shift Enter to go to the next cell. We create tensors. We'll um, prepare the data. And this is what our training splits will look like, the, the X train, the Y train, what the different splits look like. And then we'll build the model and use TensorFlow, TensorFlow to uh, build the model. So I'm just opening up TensorFlow. There we go, so TensorFlow 2.4.1. Now I'm gonna see if we have a GPU, which we don't. So um, it's a GPU device not found, right? We only requested four, four CPU cores. And then we'll be, um, we have the model fit function that is used to actually uh, train the model. So then we'll train the model and we'll just do a very simple uh, train the model for one epoch, just so you can see what it looks like. So one thing when I'm training this model is I'm actually um, saving the model output inside the process data folder. Training it. Was it done? Yeah, it's a train. So there we go. So I think if we look back to a terminal, we're in there. Oh, there we go. All right, there we go. That's what I wanted to see. It took a little bit of time, I think, because it's, I mean, we're running it on the CPU. So obviously, if you had a GPU, it'd be quite a bit faster. Um, also, uh, I mean, this model could be tuned a lot better, probably. It's kind of slow anyways to train. So now we've trained that model just for one epic, so it's not really trained, but um, the output is saved to the CD. Oh, um, when you press CD and then dot, dot, that'll bring you to the previous folder or one folder up in the hierarchy. So I'm in the, the data folder. I want to go to CD processed. And then that, this model folder was just created that should have saved the model that we just trained. CD 
model. The saved model. Yeah, so there we go. Oh five, oh four. I think that's today, right? So that's the one we just trained. Cool. All right, so that kind of brings up the the Jupyter notebook portion of this tutorial. Um, yeah, it's just a really great resource. I mean, essentially, you can have a really crappy computer sitting at your home, but actually have it powered by like a really powerful computer in the back end. As long as you have two nice monitors or monitor, you're probably better off than like, I don't know, 99% of all the other schmucks out there. Um, so yeah, just encourage you if you're going to be doing data exploration, um, uh, just, you know, data science work, building models, things like that. You know, you can use this environment and really uh, yeah, just do some good work. So any questions? Cool. Well, like I said, I'm always available. So <laughs> just feel free to, to tap me on the shoulder, send me an email, and I'm happy to jump on a call with you. Okay, so next. Um, yeah, so that, this is like one paradigm, I think. Um, quite frankly, like I spend most of my time in a Jupyter notebook, just like trying things. And then once I've sort of worked out, I, I follow this. Um, I very much do follow this, this workflow. You start with the Jupyter notebook and you like trial, build stuff inside of it. And then you move into a, um, where you build like, Actually, different scripts, and you have a you know a Python file for your classes, the Python files for your training for your training models, and that. And then you package all those things together, and then you can deploy them onto um, Compute Canada cluster using batch jobs. And so that's what we'll do next, um, a little bit more briefly, but that's what we'll do. So we'll just go back. And by the way, like if you do use MATLAB often, you can do the exact same thing with MATLAB. I just haven't done it. Um, so you can have MATLAB running um, through Compute Canada. So now we're going to go to the scheduling jobs. And um, yeah, so we'll just quickly go over um, how to schedule jobs. Again, it's like you learn by doing. So, I mean, I can show you whatever you want, but I mean, not until you actually try things and mess around with it and make mistakes will you actually know how to do it. So feel free to do that on your own. But for that, I'm just gonna open up presentation here. Um, and you can, I think, find a YouTube video where they go through this. Just a quick primer on scheduling jobs and how to submit jobs. So why use a job scheduler? Well, it is like the default um, system on, on this Compute Canada um, environment. There's all these CPUs and uh, uh, the scheduler is able to sort of coordinate between all the different jobs being submitted and slot your job in. Um, and that's used, done by something called Slurm, which is an open source scheduler. And it's pretty much standard in high performance computing environments. So there's a number of things you can specify when you are submitting a job, a batch job, like the wall time. So the maximum length of time your job will take to run. So number of CPU cores, maybe the distribution across the nodes, the memory, so per core or total. Um, if you are using a GPU, the number of GPUs or the type of GPU, Slurm partition, uh, the reservation. So the reservation would be like, oh, do you want to run it on Defmachesk, like our rapid access service because eh, maybe it's like, it's not time sensitive or maybe you want to um, uh, use one of the GPUs we have so you can run it on our rack, the RRG Machesk. Um, you can also run proprietary software on here too. Um, so if you have weird software, you can do that. So uh, 
if you are running a, a rapid access service, um, it's allocated by a fair share mechanism and also somewhat for a, um, a rack. And essentially like the more you use it, uh, the more your um, priority sort of goes down in the list. Um, so I don't think this will be, a, yeah, you can read more about it here. So if you think about it, um, if say you want to run uh, a little script that is going to um, create a bunch of features from a little data set you have, machinery data, and uh, the script will take one hour to run. Um, yeah, because it's so small, it can fit in in a lot of different places. And uh, yeah, but I mean, some people, depending on what research area you're in, uh, they might have jobs that run for days and days. Like the max time you can schedule is like 28 days. It's so maybe if you're doing like some crazy like weather simulation or something. Um, so uh, yeah, you can think of it like this. We have all these different nodes, different cores in it, and uh, the scheduler will slot them in. So if your job is smaller, you know, if you, you can be backfilled, like if you have an hour long job, it can easily be like slotted into a place in between these bigger jobs. Um, so that's really handy. Um, yeah. And of course, also, if you are, um, uh, depending on how you construct your jobs, like if you are just generate a bullet bunch of features from um, a data set, you may be able to parallelize that. So you can just distribute the data across say a hundred different nodes, hundred different cores and have each core calculate uh, a different feature or maybe each core look at just a segment of the data, calculate a bunch of features for that. So because of that, you can really like take advantage of, of this backfilling by um, running jobs in parallel. So you can go more into this later. Okay, I'm just going to skip to this. Talk about array jobs. Yeah, another thing is like you can schedule array jobs. So array jobs are essentially just you um, call a whole bunch of batch jobs all at once. And this makes it easier for the scheduler to fit them in because it knows that you want to run all these jobs. So it can really do a good job. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll give some examples of, of that. So we are going to run our own little job. And uh, I'll just give you the, the template that we did and then we'll run it. And then um, you can go in and kind of explore on your own. So, <laughs> so we have met all these prerequisites. We've cloned our repository, which is good. We've logged in hopefully and um, now we're going to nav navigate to our project folder and to this Compute Canada HPC folder we cloned and go to the scheduling jobs folder. Go CD, I'm in my home directory. CD projects, Jeff Michewski, my username is Tivi Han. Um, so we're going to CD compute Canada. So there we go. I want to go to this folder, scheduling jobs. So go CD03, press tab, fills it in automatically. And there we go. LS. So in this scheduling jobs folder, we have a number of different um, files. So we have a random search CPU, random search GPU, and then a number of scripts that I've created. And all these, these are scripts that will like in that last Jupyter notebook we looked at. This one, these scripts will be um, training variational autocoder model. It'll be running one random search and training that model for like an iteration or an epic or two. So that's what we'll be doing. So we'll be running one of these scripts and uh, training a variational autoencoder on the data. Uh, 
But... So anyways, what we'll do is we will um, look at one of these files just so we can understand what's going on. So I'll go to nano, open up our text editor, nano, random search cpu.sh. Okay, so here we go. This is our, our script. So many of the, the, um, the batch script, bash scripts that they're using to run jobs will, will look similar to this. There's lots of examples on Compute Canada's Wikipedia. You can kind of like copy the templates and then modify them. So we'll be running this job on our um, rack account, so our GMHS. I'll be requesting four CPUs, so four cores, four gigabytes total, so across all the cores. The amount of time we want this job to run for, which is 10 minutes. I mean, generally you don't actually really want to be running jobs that are like say less than an hour, but I mean, it doesn't matter. Um, but I mean, this is just for fun. So 10 minutes is fine. And uh, the output, so we'll save the output file into this folder. And then um, I will, uh, be getting an email notification for when the job begins, when it ends, and if there's any problems. And uh, you can type in your email there. So I'll just be doing that. Okay. So then what happens once um, the scheduler, once we input this job, the scheduler will look at it with these parameters. And uh, It'll schedule it into uh, you know when it can run first because we have a dedicated allocation. It'll likely happen very quickly. But when it does run finally, it'll load our module. So Python three point six. It'll activate our Jupyter notebook. I'm oh, sorry, not activate a Jupyter notebook. It'll activate our virtual environment, and then it'll run this train model tcn.py, which will train the variational autoencoder. Some uh, key things and some good things to remember is that um, uh, I am in this script, I've specifically made it so that I save the model output to the scratch folder. So if you're looking to the train model underscore TCN, you'd see that I saved the model into the scratch folder. That's because you don't wanna be doing tons of writes onto the, in the project folder, it's not designed for that. You should save it to the scratch folder. So that's something just good, good to keep in mind. Another interesting thing, um, say you're running tons of array jobs, rather than, um, so say you're running hundred different array jobs. So hundred, the, the schedule will be calling on a hundred different batch jobs, rather than calling on one, um, uh, um, virtual environments, you know, it'll, it'll constantly be calling on this virtual environment from our home directory. It's almost more efficient, which might be counterintuitive. It's more efficient to actually create the virtual environment inside the script, inside this bash script. And then, so each time you call this, um, one of these scripts is loaded, it automatically creates the virtual environment. And then in a temporary directory, and then when the job finishes, that virtual environment just disappears. So that's something to, to keep in mind if you run lots of array jobs. There's some good documentation on Compute Canada about that. So anyways, this is what it looks like for running um, this job on the CPU. So go we'll save this and then control X for exiting. If we go to the GPU, it's similar except that um, I've requested a GPU, GPU-1. So that's just requesting a generic GPU resources resource, which is a one P100 GPU. And then, yeah, so it's pretty much the same thing. But I won't be running that one because I want to conserve GPU resources for important tasks. So anyways, now we'll just uh, run this. How you run a, a, a batch job is you s batch, which calls a scheduler, and then um, 
So random search cpu.sh. So it's submitted a batch job. Now we can see what the status of this batch job is by going squ sq dot u u is for user or dash u tv on oh okay so yeah so and this is the one that i just requested so you also see here that i have this rg machest cpu which is this is the um the jupyter notebook that we currently have open this one here so yeah it's 9 41 left I think if you go to my email too. Just move this out of the way. Don't want you to see any of my sensitive content. Where's it? Here we go, see? This is the this is the job we just um, submitted, right there. It doesn't have anything. Uh, other than that, it says it pen. You can imagine if you're running like um, a job that takes like days and days to run. I mean, it'd be nice to get an email notification if something goes wrong. So that's what that's there for. Okay. Well, let's go on here. Right. So um, yeah, let's see what else we can do here. So LS, <coughs> you can see that this gram, this is the output file. So that you can use this for debugging purposes. If something fails, you can look into it and often see what, what, what went wrong. Um, and then finally, I'll just go to the CD scratch. Let's see models. Let's see, save. Oh yeah, this is the one. So I think right there, this is the job. We're saving the results of each model that we're training into this CSV file. And but the saved models, to save models. Yes. Yeah, this is the one right there. The Yeah, so anyways, we have the two with the, the full model and then the encoder portion of the variational autoencoder are being saved. So into the scratch directory, because I don't want to, you know, pollute our um, a project directory. So yeah, so running array jobs, um, it's similar. I won't be running, I won't be going through one here. Um, but uh, yeah, so they allocate each run of a script to a different core <clears throat> in each core or multiple cores. And so if you're going to be running a script multiple times, um, but you know there aren't many changes between each script that you're running, you can run an array job. So maybe um, like for a random search, which I'm doing in machine learning, I, I just tweak some of the parameters between different um, model runs. Randomly, I tweak the parameters. Well, that's really easy that uh, you can run through an array job. One example I used is, um, which I mentioned in the PowerPoint presentation, I used an array job to generate features like RMS, ketosis, FFT, over a whole bunch of um, CNC machine data. So about 300 unique signals. So like I said, to do that normally on my local computer, it took like more than three days, but I was able to speed it up with a, an array job. So I called like 110 or 111 CPUs and I just distributed the data amongst all the CPUs and had each CPU, each core calculate um, the required features. And then I just um, compiled the final results into one. Um, and so you can go through some details here of how I did that. And uh, some things that are good to know. Um, yeah, this is kind of how you 
would do an array job. In this example here is what I did. Yeah, and so, um, yeah, that's kind of that. I'll just go through some best practices and then some good things to know, and then we'll uh, open it up to any, if anyone has any questions. So best practices. Um, yeah, so like I said, should really only be doing, um, shouldn't be running computational stuff on the logging node. You know, if you want to test things, you can um, request a small allocation, like spin up, uh, you know, two or three CPUs and try stuff on that, or just uh, test it locally and then move it onto the Compute Canada. And only request resources, memory, running time that's needed. Um, it's just good etiquette and uh, also won't waste our resources. So test before scaling. So that means, um, yeah, it's like if you're going to be doing this big job, um, see how it scales so that you sort of know um, how difficulties that could come up. What are the, some good things? Yeah, so don't store millions of small files. Um, yeah, like what would be better is you have all your files compiled into some sort of um, like a tar or dar or zip file, and then you would uh, call on that zip file, and then you would copy it into a temporary um, fast writing storage, open it up, and then once your job's done, it just poof, it sort of disappears. I think that's about it. Yeah. Yeah, this is just tips regarding Python jobs and arrays. This is what I was saying earlier. If you're going to be doing um, lot running lots of arrays or lots of scripts, or lots of batch jobs in an array, it's often easier just to um, create the virtual environment in that specific um, batch job rather than calling on a virtual environment that you already have in your home directory. So finally, um, yeah, I guess in order to close this node, if we wanted to, we could go control C and then we're just press control C a bunch of time and that would close this, this uh, notebook and then you can exit out. Any questions? I know it's been a lot, but um, I mean, like I said, the way you really learn is by just doing so practice, just try some things. And um, yeah, I mean, this really is ours to explore and exploit. I mean, so uh, if you have things you want to try and experiment with, by all means, right? If we use this, you know, use it productively, not doing stupid stuff, but if we use it and we show we're capable and build up our expertise, you know, that will really be good for the group going forward for future students. Um, in terms of uh, building competency within the group, but also allowing us to um, continue to use it more and, and gain more resources when, when we need to. So, yep, I'll open up the floor to any questions if anyone has any. Thank you, team, for your presentation. It was interesting. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot. I don't have any thanks. questions per se, but that was really thorough and easy to follow. I, I thought everything was really well organized. So um, like I've, I've worked with terminal clients many times in the past. I don't know for people with other backgrounds if that was easy to digest, but I was able to follow along start to finish. That was really well done. Yeah, well, thanks. I mean, I the only way you learn is by doing right so i mean we're all engineers like most of us are right so engineers like tinker so just tinker just fool around and you'll learn right and so and uh again i'm pleased 
like feel free to call me whenever I'm happy to help out and walk you through things too because I've spent a decent amount of time playing around with the system and that so yeah all right any other questions if not I'll let you guys go thanks Tim okay I appreciate it. It. yeah so I'll um send out the slides and then um okay. I guess I'll send out the video too somehow and then you can look at that in case you want to rerun it but yeah, please, please use this system. It's 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 ours to use. So yeah. Okay. Talk to you all later. Yeah. Right on. Thanks again, Tim. Yeah. Bye. 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 Bye.